All right, so I'm going to get us started here and just say uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today for this dialogue that we have, you know, really simply titled um, Understanding California's Infrastructure uh, Funding. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeremy Madsen. I'm the executive director here at Build a Green. And uh, this dialogue that we're having today, it was inspired by work over the last few months of our Infrastructure is an opportunity working group, um, which many of you have been have been part of. And today is actually our last official meeting <clears throat> of the working group. So uh, woohoo, congratulations to uh, the working group for the uh, the efforts that we've done in the last uh, few months. And um, uh, as we uh, get toward the end of the meeting, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about what we're we're hoping to and planning to do next. Um, so um, we want to get a sense of who's with us today, um, and so I want to encourage everyone to answer the following um, in the in the chat. So we want to have you tell us who you are, um, tell us your favorite way to celebrate, um, and then also uh, share with us what makes um, uh, the topic of infrastructure interesting to you. Um, so. Um, in a you know moment, two or three minutes, I'm going to introduce three really incredible people who um, are going to share their knowledge and their experience with us, and get our conversation really started. Um, but you know, first, I want to kind of quickly explain how we got to this point uh, today. So, um, I, again, most of you know, or many of you know, that uh, Big um, uh, sees an interwoven array of affordability, social equity environmental challenges uh, within California's housing system and really at the heart of the housing crisis we have. And, you know, we're fiercely committed to the proposition that addressing any one of these challenges should not come at the expense of uh, our state's aspirations around, around the others. And, you know, we see the, the siloing of different stakeholders, different agencies, different bodies of work as really being a huge impediment to, to addressing the housing crisis in a, in a holistic way. So last December, we hosted uh, what we called at the time the, the Building Our Future meetings, uh, you know, a couple of different Zoom meetings where we tested this idea that if we brought together community-based activists with government leaders, with uh, the advocacy community, and you know, folks in the private sector, uh, you know, big and small players working on, on development and construction issues, um, would we have enough in common to really want to work together in that, you know, holistic way where we see the entirety of the housing system? And, you know, we got a positive answer out of, out of those meetings. Uh, people did want to uh, try to work together. And with the, you know, the $1 trillion bipartisan federal infrastructure bill having just passed the previous month, one of the topics that, you know, rose to the top in terms of interest areas was to work together on the opportunity to use infrastructure investment in ways that would uh, make California's communities more just and more regenerative. So that's when we formed um, the Infrastructure and Opportunity Working Group. Um, and uh, you know, again, many of you were among that group or part of that group that helped to develop a set of community-centered principles that envision really creative ways to invest infrastructure dollars to address the, the crisis, the housing crisis, and benefit our communities. Uh, Laura is going to drop that into the, the chat as well, a link to those principles. Um, I do want to say I'm excited to say that the, the principles are getting uh, some attention. Um, so last week, I was able to speak about them and you know several ideas that uh, various of you helped to generate with uh, former mayor of LA, Antonio Villaraigosa, um, who's been tapped by Governor Newsom as a senior advisor to you know, really help strategize how California can best use uh, infrastructure um, and, uh, and to ensure those projects are delivered. I think I saw Micah from California Forward pop in and uh, uh, thanks to him for the invite into that, into that meeting. So in addition to the principles, um, the working group identified um, another key issue. And that issue is that there's you know, many within our state, within the government, um, at the state level, within uh, local and regional agencies and governments, in the private sector and among community activists, who see, uh, you know, opportunities to use infrastructure dollars in ways to make communities great and to invest in affordable, environmentally beneficial housing, either directly or indirectly. Um, but, you know, a lot of these players, they don't really know how to navigate the system, 
They don't even speak the same language. And in a lot of cases, they can't even find each other. And so the opportunity to truly do transformative things with this infrastructure funding, uh, things that are transformative for homes and neighborhoods, you know, that's being missed. So today's meeting, it's a chance to really start to address this issue of missing connections and lack of alignment. And again, we're going to hear from uh, in, in incredibly knowledgeable, creative people. We're going to give us some insight about how to, the state approaches infrastructure funding, how that funding moves to regional agencies and to local governments, and what the potential is if we get really innovative about infrastructure. Um, so I'm going to introduce our, our three partners here just in a, in a second. I'll let them elaborate further on themselves and their remarks. They're going to talk for about 10 minutes each. And then we should have a solid 30 minutes and maybe even a little longer at the end for questions and discussions, which we really want to invite people into. Um, I think that's going to be the, the, the most fun part of the, the conversation. So um, uh, introductions. So our first uh, presenter is uh, Sarhanaz uh, Mirza Mir Zazad. Sorry, I was practicing that all day, Sarhanaz, and I screwed it up. Um, uh, she is oh. now the Chief uh, Deputy Director of Climate and Planning at the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. She's been in that role for about 72 or so hours. Um, uh, before that, was Deputy Director for Planning and Community in Investment at the Strategic Growth Council for about five years, uh, where she oversaw more than $3 billion of investment in infrastructure uh, programs, and community-driven policy solutions. She has um, you know, 15 or so years of experience working in both the public sector and the private sector on infrastructure development, um, including bridging climate and equity goals through the Transformative uh, Climate Communities Program that she helped to manage at, um, uh, at SGC. So let me uh, introduce the other couple of speakers, and then I just won't interrupt while they, they talk. Um, so second, we'll hear from Rebecca Lawn. She's the Director of uh, Legislative and Public Affairs at the Metropolitan Transportation Commission and the Association of Bay Area Governments. Uh, those, uh, for those of you who don't know, are two regional agencies with huge responsibilities when it comes to housing and transportation and a host of other things here in the Bay Area. And Rebecca has helped to shape the region's infrastructure landscape for over two decades. Um, Help secure passage of legislation in 2019 to create the uh, Bay Area Housing Finance uh, Finance Authority and uh, also legislation uh, to generate billions of dollars um, uh, for our region's transportation network through voter-approved uh, bridge toll increases. And then finally, we're going to have Shalini Vachala, um, the founder and CEO of Refocus Partners, which is a design firm that is dedicated to developing equitable, resilient infrastructure solutions and public-private uh, public partnerships for communities around the world. Uh, also a cold fat, a founder of the Atlas, an online platform for local government collaboration and procurement innovation. And prior to that, uh, Shalini held um, you know, numerous positions in the Obama administration at both um, the Environmental Protection Agency and the Council uh, on Environmental Quality. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarharnaz and we'll just hear from our uh, three great speakers. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this conversation, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, now that I have been uh, speaking in multiple events, I have noticed that people would like to ask more questions than me talking because it seems like we are all repeating the same things. So I will try to be concise and provide more time for a uh, conversation around the questions that you might have for me. Uh, I got a couple of uh, prompts from Jeremy that I would like to go over them with you. Um, and one of the first questions that he had for me is, what is the overall direction that the uh, governor's office is uh, heading towards? So uh, one thing that I should uh, mention here is that in the, uh, governor's office, we realize that we cannot afford silos anymore. What we are really trying to do during his term is to get out of our silos and look into the issues in a more systematic way. You have uh, probably looked into the budgets that he's putting out there in the last couple of years. We have changed the way that you're looking into the budget in general and how we can have more integrated way into looking how we're addressing different issues. Uh, probably the one that caught many of people, as I can see on this call, many housers here, 
housing as a climate strategy is something that I want to point out to. Like uh, we are looking to multi-benefit investments, looking into housing in places close to jobs and services, preservation of existing housing stock and climate ready and climate friendly housing, which we are all working to um, address how this will look like. We are looking into integrated investment and more coordination. Uh, as uh, you many of you know, uh, there's a new infrastructure uh, czar at the governor's office, and we have a cabinet level uh, coordination work group that we are uh, all working together to identify how we can support him to access federal dollars and how this will look like in the state level and how it will complement the work that we are doing here instead of our own dollars. Um, you will see more of those integration in uh, upcoming years. Um, we are centering everything around equity, uh, reaching out to all communities and making sure that we have boots on the ground to support us in implementing our vision and goals. And as you know, the governor has a very bold goals out there and putting resources into it. We had $54 billion in California climate commitment this year. Last year, $10.3 billion in Budget Act for Housing. We added $2.9 million to that for housing production and homeownership opportunities. And we have $6 billion investment to expand broadband uh, infrastructure and enhance internet access for underserved uh, communities. Um, and also looking into some of the goals that we're trying to pursue in different areas across uh, different sectors. Example, climate adaptation. We have uh, been working on how this could we looked into it more strategically, uh, like uh, in the transportation sector. I think MTC has um, have been supporting a bill that we looked into how we can uh, look into our transportation sector to have more uh, space, uh, green, to have like a green infrastructure to be part of that. Uh, the other areas that I would like to discuss here is um, we would like, again, as I mentioned, systematic, systematic approach and integrated approach to understand where disparities are and where we can be most impactful. Um, our goal is bold in every area that you look and into it. Governor has three million, uh, goal of three million climate ready friendly homes by 2030. 100% of new car sales in the state uh, to be zero emission by 2035. And this cannot be accomplished if we are not breaking silos and looking across the board, uh, how they can be integrated and how they can be used their limited resources that we have. We cannot like the what we are, we have right now, the budget that we have right now is like one time opportunity, both in the state level and federal level. Probably we will not see something like that in our lifetime anymore how we can maximize the dollars that we have to get to and achieve these goals, which all of them are important. I cannot um, say that climate is about housing or any of them. All of them are important. We will be uh, not um, succeed as a society if we don't pay attention to all of them in a systematic way. And if one of them falls short of the other one. So we have to look into them, how we can pursue all of them at the same time and not uh, basically just get ourselves in a way that we have been in the past operating in silos, only housing goals while we are building in and our natural resources, land, the things that we should have preserved for carbon uh, sequestration and all of that. Those mentalities gone. We are like operating in a different way. And, uh, governor is encouraging that in all ways that he can. Uh, one other thing that I uh, was asked to provide an overview of is like a couple of strategic recommendations for community groups and local governments to engage and find synergy with the state folks is that in the next couple of years, there will be a lot of funds, state and feds. Um, you need to be strategic in getting ready to access these funds. How can you, how can you organize to pay for pre-development costs? Can you bring dollars to your communities that will open opportunities for other dollars? That's the thing that I really encourage you to look into it. Uh, how can you collaborate to address multiple issues with one funding? And how you can look into areas that you can address multiple issues with one in, uh, investment. And every agency that we are looking with here, uh, we are working with here is hungry for those type of solutions. We all know that the old way of doing business is not working. So if you think in the local level more creatively and bring solutions, we promise that we'll look into how we can provide flexibility to be able to implement those ideas uh, from the dollars that we are investing. 
and hopefully it will be the same with the uh, federal dollars. And I also would like to uh, provide some um, uh, like recommendation to regional entities and community groups that uh, to step into coordination role and capacity building role and provide high level support for smaller jurisdictions that don't have the capacity to access these type of funds. Uh, please have a strategy in place to make sure that uh, the funds will be uh, like uh, distributed uh, like uh, in equitable fashion and how you can have like specific equity consideration when you're applying. Even within larger uh, jurisdictions that usually tap into the state or federal dollars more, some communities within those jurisdictions are left behind. How you can like rethink the way that you're investing in your communities to bring those, uh, those communities to the forefront of your investment and make sure that people are like accessing this fund. They are having like opportunities. We are not like concentrating our dollars in one area or two. So that's the things I really want to encourage you to think through. And hopefully, uh, if we all orchestrate our work around this integration and equity consideration and more systematic thinking, we'll be, be able to address this like whole challenges that we are facing and also hopefully get to the goals that we are having out there. And it's really bold goals without collaboration and integration will not be uh, able to achieve those. So those are my uh, short conversation. Hopefully I didn't go over 10 minutes, Jeremy. Um, I'll pass it to, I think, Rebecca, right? Okay, great. Thanks, Saharnaz. And um, thank you so much, uh, Build It Green, for inviting me to speak to you today. I also am going to try to stay under 10 minutes. And um, I have a lot to say, so I did write it out. So apologies if it feels like I'm I'm reading, but I'll try to be a dynamic reader. Um, so my goal today is to give you some insights into the somewhat mysterious, though quite important role that regional agencies play in the infrastructure space, um, especially as it relates to the goals that this group has been grappling with. And I do want to really commend the principles. I found them personally very inspiring and as a great kind of touch point for um, our own advocacy work. Um, and so those goals really are around public transit, affordable housing, climate change, resilience, and equity. Um, MTC and ABAG is, you know, thinking about these things all the time, and they're very much um, part of the way we're designing grant programs and our advocacy. Um, but first, I do want to orient you a little bit more to MTC and ABAG. Um, so MTC is a pretty unique organization. Uh, we wear many hats. Uh, some of you in the Bay Area may know of the Clipper card, uh, Transit Smart card, that's MTC. We also administer Fast Track. Um, and we are basically the, the metropolitan planning organization for the Bay Area. Um, but in 2019, the legislature gave us um, a new role uh, in affordable housing finance by establishing the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority, or BAFA, uh, which has the same board and staff as MTC. Um, and so one of the core things that MTC is responsible for as an MPO is adopting a long range transportation plan. Um, it gets updated every four years. And we're also the recipient of hundreds of millions of dollars in annual state and federal transportation funds that come directly to the region that we then have responsibility for prioritizing and allocating. Um, then meanwhile, ABAG is responsible for allocating uh, the number of housing units that each city and county in the Bay Area must plan and zone for uh, through the process known as RENA, which I'm sure you all are aware of. Um, so Plan Bay Area is our current long range plan, and it's also known at the state level as the Sustainable Community Strategy, and it's adopted um, jointly by MTC and APAG. And so every four years we have to update this plan. Um, and it's really a forecast of the anticipated transportation revenues at all levels of government over the next 25 years, matched against our needs and priorities across all modes. And then we determine which projects that are already in the pipeline uh, or are being proposed should be pursued and on what timeline. And then a key part of that is the land use uh, assumptions that are built into um, that plan as well. And so these tough decisions are informed by robust stakeholder and public engagement, uh, cost benefit analysis, performance assessments, and, and key goals that are defined in state law. And the most important of those um, in terms of really shaping our work and, and that what we really have to achieve is a reduction in per capita greenhouse gas emissions um, from passenger vehicles by at least 19% 
uh, by 2035, and that's compared to um, 2005 levels. And then we also have to demonstrate that the way that we're we're planning at the regional scale for growth in housing that it should uh, accommodate population growth at all income levels uh, within the nine counties. Um, so this uh, most recent plan went even beyond transportation, land use, and climate change to highlight equity and resilience as core objectives. Um, we supported in the plan a $20 billion investment to protect our uh, transportation infrastructure from sea level rise, um, which had the co-benefit of protecting almost 90,000 homes from flooding. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the funds. <laughs> we don't have those 20 billion yet. So those are the kinds of things that um, drive our advocacy. And um, as was mentioned, some of our uh, work looking for climate adaptation uh, funds for transportation this past year. And then um, from an equity standpoint, you know, we really uh, analyze projects to see how do they benefit our equity priority communities and how do they perform on an equity standpoint. And some projects simply, you know, didn't make it into the last plan because they really did not perform well on equity. Um, turning now to funding, um, as I mentioned, we do have discretion over quite a bit of funding and, and really Plan Bay Area um, is the way that we prioritize those funds. If it's not in the plan, you know, someone's proposing a project, um, it's pretty much off the table. Um, so this planning process really has some real world consequences. Um, now, just to turn to funding, uh, when it comes to public transit funding, most of the funds that come to MTC are federal formula funds, and we really prioritize those for state of good repair, but there are also um, significant transit expansion funds, for example, for new lines, extending BART to Silicon Valley, um, that are available on a competitive basis. And what we have um, really leaned into in this past year is trying to organize the region around specific priorities so that our many operators aren't competing against each other and we can really speak with one voice um, in Washington and, and in Sacramento. And then on the highway side, um, we receive funding from several large uh, federal highway programs that are actually quite flexible. So they're highway funds, but they can fund all kinds of bike ped improvements as well as transit. And we've combined those into a program known as the One Bay Area Grant Program or OBAG. And what's really unique about this program is how we've leveraged it to achieve goals well beyond um, the benefits of the projects themselves. Um, so for example, we've attached mandates that in order to be eligible for those funds, you have to, for example, have a complete streets policy. Um, we're now proposing that you must have an anti-displacement policy as it relates to housing. So. Um, we're really trying to leverage these as a, a carrot to drive the types of change that is in Plan Bay area. And a really timely example of that is our transit-oriented communities policy, um, which the commission is actually slated to adopt tomorrow. Um, this policy is going to impose new <clears throat> residential and commercial density requirements um, in transit priority areas, um, provides uh, prohibition on minimum parking requirements, actually has some maximum parking requirements in these areas. Um, and so again, it's really with the funds, funding sources that we have at our um, discretion that we're able to uh, push those policies forward. Um, we also do a lot of advocacy work, uh, both in Sacramento and Washington, and it really has been a remarkable uh, few years. I mean, there's so many programs, it's hard to keep track. Um, and we did champion a few that I just wanted to highlight today um, that I think are really at the forefront of some of this, this integrated work. Um, one is this new $400 million transportation climate adaptation program, um, half of which is oriented towards state transportation assets, the other towards more local, administered by Caltrans and the California Transportation Commission. There's a new uh, $250 million regional resilience grant program uh, administered by uh, the Office of Planning and Research. So Saharzad knows all about that. And then um, the biggest of them all, which was very exciting, is the new $600 million uh, so-called REAP 2.0 program um, that is kind of jointly aiming at uh, promoting infill housing while also reducing vehicle miles traveled. And that's administered by um, HCD Housing and Community Development Department. So I'm really excited about these programs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but for the sake of just getting uh, the discussion going, I do want to just share a few concerns. Um, 
one is uh, I do worry that some of the laws creating these programs have become are, are written in a very complex way and maybe some of the guidelines too so that they could potentially inhibit great projects from being funded where you know a project might hit let's say seven out of the ten criteria but just not check all the boxes and and I worry that you know that might be a missed opportunity there and I also worry a little bit about some of the public engagement pieces which you know are so important um, to be you know ensuring that um, the types of projects that are being prioritized are really those that that are what's needed um, but there is a lot of uh, public engagement happening through the planning process and having grant specific public engagement um, you know could potentially backfire by causing community members or the community-based organizations that that we partner with to Kind of disengage if we're just constantly coming back um, to them again and again. So those are just a, a few little concerns to raise. Um, for us, you know, it really comes back to Plan Bay Area. Um, it's the foundation upon which we build all of our, our funding priorities and our advocacy, and it would be great if the state grant programs and federal could really build on that work and um, guard against creating too much complexity uh, with new grant programs. So those are some of my uh, concerns. Of course, we should expect growing pains moving from the siloed model of the 20th century to one in which we really recognize how interconnected these issues are um, and find the optimal approaches to fund creative multi-benefit infrastructure that enhances equity. And I do think we're on the right track and I'm super excited to see the results and lessons learned um, from these latest efforts. So that includes my prepared remarks and I'm really looking forward to the rest of this conversation. Thanks. All right, we'll go to Shalini to uh, to jump on in. Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks to the big team. I, Saharnas, Rebecca, I love following you both here because I feel like we have a set of nesting dolls from the um, big picture policy and funding environment to the regional planning. And what my team and I do at Refocus is we really look to move money and shovels to communities for resilient infrastructure projects. And that looks different in a lot of different communities. But I was tasked by Jeremy with sharing some of the secret sauce on how do you actually mobilize infrastructure dollars for community benefit. And so I'm gonna share uh, four flavors of sauce that we use inside of Refocus and really try to give you all a set of questions that I hope you can take off into your own lines of work and apply to reveal new types of projects that are possible. So, our team at Refocus very early on, I, as Jeremy mentioned, I came out of the EPA and one of the things that I realized in starting this firm was that oftentimes for the work we were doing, success is something that doesn't happen. And this is true in the resilience space, it's true in the equity space, you know, the storm hits but the community isn't flooded. From a public position in the first year, that's, a, that's worthy of applause. It's fantastic. You avoided something we knew was coming. In the second year, you clearly don't need your budget because it's not happening anymore. And in the third year, your staff go away. So what our work really focuses on is making sure that people understand what avoided losses look like in all of our projects. Why is it worth investing in these things to make sure that something doesn't happen? that a community isn't marginalized or left behind or experiencing health, the negative health and economic outcomes. So one of the very first things we do is try to reveal who are the motivated champions for making sure that projects actually get done. And one of the best ways we've found to actually do that is to ask a very simple finance question inside the project design process. And that is to ask, who loses money if we don't do this? So I wanna give you an example from work that we've done with multiple transit authorities around the issue of extreme heat. So if you think about this as an equity problem, it's pretty straightforward to understand who suffers, right? It's transit dependent workers, it's elderly people who are left out longer in the heat when tracks buckle and trains don't come, right? So. What may be counterintuitive though, when you think about serving those people and advancing equity, is that one of the ways to do it is to ask this question, who loses money? <clears throat> Which is the flip side of the coin to who suffers. If you, if you look at who loses money when transit systems are in extreme heat, every day that's over 95 degrees in a row actually creates infrastructure vulnerabilities. 
Well, what does that mean? A lot of transit systems run fewer trains and they run them more slowly, the hotter it gets and the more hot days you have in a row. That means they're actually seeing revenue impacts on their balance sheet. And you don't have to go hunting and pecking for future benefits. That's value today. Those are savings that you can capture today. Now, all of a sudden, you can finance a heat resilience project the same way you might finance an energy efficiency project. You look for a bill, you create the savings, and you use the savings to pay for the thing that reduces the bill. That's one of the ways that we've found to really open doors to different types of infrastructure projects at Refocus. And we found ways to do that at a small scale and going up to $100 million scale projects. So it's a durable type of question. The second way that we approach our work on infrastructure is we are, um, we all, we all are former government officials in various capacities and have worked with federal and state and local government. So we don't just enough to be dangerous across sectors. And so we look for ways to align projects that generate revenues <clears throat> with projects that generate complementary benefits, but may not be revenue generating. So one of the projects that I'm personally most proud of is off in the city of Hoboken, which is a tiny single square mile city across the Hudson River from New York, across from Manhattan. And Hoboken was under 12 feet of water during Hurricane Sandy. It's 98% paved. And we were able to work with the city shortly after the storm to say, well, what do you actually need? And once they got over the first 10 answers being flood pumps, they said, well, we need parks and parking and more thoughtful open space. And so we worked with them on a six acre site redevelopment. I think they just handed us the most contaminated and challenging parcel to see what we could do with it. And we developed a municipal parking garage with the water utility to create a bathtub for holding flood water that helped avoid the need to build new pumps and new water treatment, but also created green space on top. So at the end of the day, um, this project is under construction now and expected to be completed later this year. We helped the city secure the first $30 million by basically helping to use parking funding revenues to pay for flood mitigation. These aren't questions that we um, have developed lightly. We've actually made these simpler and simpler and simpler with every year of work that we've done. And I think that's incredibly important for making sure that folks don't feel intimidated by the idea of infrastructure or bludgeoned by the engineering and finance, but able to engage in dialogues about what infrastructure is meant to deliver for their communities. So last two examples, um, we also look for where we can create cross-sector values. So Saharnas, I think we aspire to silo busting, but a lot of times we're opening silo doors and gently inviting people to visit other silos. <laughs> and two areas where we've done that are looking, for example, at where green stormwater infrastructure, think about all those lovely sponge-like features of water systems, um, can create maintenance savings. And the city of El Paso is a fantastic example here. They had been trying to build green infrastructure for several years, and every single project was shot down by the maintenance department because it was seen as a beautification project or an added cost. And it was an added cost because the maintenance department hadn't been consulted. What we did is we looked at what the benefits of green infrastructure were for reducing flash flood damages to roads and dug through the maintenance costs over several years to look at where you could actually increase asset lifetimes and save on things like workman's comp and overtime. So we were able to help finance projects and reduce internal opposition and barriers by just looking across sectors. One of the most powerful opportunities that I think we all as a collective have at our fingertips is doing this kind of thing and looking at where one type of infrastructure might be blocking another. And so Jeremy, this is where we, you and I have traded emails about where water and sewer infrastructure upgrades are blocking affordable housing projects and developers are shaving down the number of units to cover the costs. That to me is just a failure of imagination on how you build infrastructure and it's solvable without new legislation. It's where you need creative project design and finance. So the last um, flavor of sauce that I'll give you is we over the years have really built finance into our design process. 
and have started working with insurance companies and looking at where our work reduces financial risk. This has ranged from projects like you heard um, on transit and heat and maintenance, but also things like the Ike Dyke in coastal Texas, which is a $35 billion Army Corps project that will reduce insurance risk for all the major corporates around the city of Houston. But then again, coming back to who suffers, what motivates our team to do this work is protecting those workers in outer Houston from every storm, every chemical release, every plant explosion that we've seen over the last five years. And so for me, infrastructure is very much about who is safer, who has more well-being, who's better off, and how do we make sure that the widest possible set of folks are served? So I will stop there and hand it back to you, Jeremy. All right. So um, I just want to say thank you to all three of you. Um, uh, as I said a, a moment ago, these are uh, wonderful people, some of which, like Rebecca, I've known for 20 years, or Hines and uh, about a year, and then Shalini in just the last few months. And they're like, and everybody on this call is among my favorite people, but these are really three of my favorite people. And I love the creativity and um, uh, thoughtfulness and uh, and passion that you guys have for, for this issue and helping us all kind of navigate this, what really is a maze around infrastructure and infrastructure financing, um, but also, uh, you know, kind of elevating what we get once we uh, get through the maze. Um, so uh, for everyone, we want to kind of open this up and now have a, a real conversation, um, you know, with all in the in the meeting. Um, and um, uh, uh, but I want to make sure that we're doing a few things here. So one is uh, we do want to look at what's the role that Build It Green should have and that this network that um, you all are part of should have uh, as we go forward on the infrastructure topic. So Laura is gonna drop a Jamboard into the chat. Uh, one page on there is uh, just all about capturing ideas for what should come next. Um, so go visit that and drop some ideas if you uh, if you wish. You can also verbally uh, throw those out there as we, as we go forward. Um, and then also on the Jamboard is uh, some questions uh, for all of you to think about um, that, that we'd like to pose back to, to you all. I think Laura is going to try to drop those into the chat too. I'm not going to do them verbally, um, but they're all in there to kind of get your, uh, your creative thinking uh, uh, flowing. And I, I actually had a couple of questions, you know, myself, um, but I think I'm going to skip those from now. And because I, I do see some questions coming in from folks. Um, for uh, Shalini, Rebecca, and Sarhanaz. Um, uh, one thing I do want to do, though, before I go to those questions is just flag, you know, a few things that I heard, uh, or maybe one kind of highlight that I heard from uh, each of the speakers. And so, uh, you know, the first one from Sarhanaz saying, this really is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, for for us. Um, you know, the the combination of the federal investment, the state investment, I don't even think we mentioned um, the um, kind of the associated opportunities around the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, but that's out there as, as well. So once in a lifetime opportunity, uh, Rebecca, you didn't use these exact words, but when you were talking about like these these checklists and making sure they're not, um, uh, you know, kind of overly onerous. Um, we want to make sure the perfect isn't the enemy of the good. Um, we can slow down and stop, I think, a lot of projects um, that are really going to be beneficial to our communities by saying one little thing is wrong with them. Obviously, they have to be good enough. Um, but, you know, perfect being the enemy of the good, I think, is something we should we should be thinking about. And then, um, uh, Shalini, of the various different things I could have pulled out, um, one thing you said in there was, what is infrastructure really meant to deliver? And I think that is, you know, an infrastructure project for the sake of an infrastructure project is, you know, maybe it's delivering some, you know, jobs and economic development for those that are that are building it. But really, what is that long term impact that we want to see? And so I think like keeping things like that in mind as we enter further into this discussion um, uh, will be will be wonderful. So I want to open it up now. I know a couple of you have thrown things into into uh, chat. If um, uh, uh, if any of you like uh, Lenore or um, 
uh, I thought there were a couple of other people out there who uh, want to kind of chime in with your question. We can get going from there. I'll be happy to start. Um, and thank you very much for the presentations too. And um, yeah, what a great opportunity we have in front of us. And um, and it's it's terrific to be connected with a lot of new people as well who have experience in infrastructure. Um, I've been for the last 10 years working with the intersection of healthcare and housing and um, and particularly for older adults. And um, and so that's the the lens I bring to this uh, to this um, party. Um, but I also I'm uh, I serve on the independent watchdog committee for Alameda County Measures B and BB, which is kicks out about thirty million dollars a year in transportation um, projects, both for city, for the eleven cities in Alameda County. And um, some I have a big question. Some of these projects are really long term. And so they're, you know, they get funding, the jurisdictions get funding allocated to them in the millions of dollars for highway widening projects and several other things that um, to me, I've got a, a, I sit there and I think, wow, are some of these things even still relevant? Are they still meeting the mark, you know, 10 years later in Shalini, you, you gave some really prime examples of, you know, how that happens. And so um, how how does a program like um, OBAG or or some of the work you're doing, you know, make sure that you're leveraging or or that we're watching those things, you know, over the long term to make sure that we're not, yeah, uh, throwing good money after bad. Rebecca, you should go first. <laughs> okay, sure. I'll take a stab at that. It's a great question. Um, and, you know, one thing that immediately comes to mind is that the state has been, you know, asking some of those questions. Um, California's adopted a plan. I'm going to forget the acronym again. It's like Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure. I think that's what it is. And, you know, within that plan, they kind of talk about the need to reassess, right, just because we have projects that have been in the pipeline for a very long time, some of which may even have been voter approved. You know, should we necessarily just continue trying to fund those projects, some of which are highway widenings and interchanges? So I think it's a very um, live conversation. And as I mentioned with Plan Bay Area, you know, we really did reassess, you know, everything. We didn't just put everything in the plan and say, well, it's been in there for, you know, the last two plans, it's going to go forward. We did a, a performance assessment of every major project. Um, and I think, you know, I think that's appropriate. And I think it is something that um, certainly we're doing in the Bay Area, and it is a live conversation in Sacramento, too. Uh, Lenore, I would, I would just add to that one of the kind of simple ways we dislodge people um, who might be attached to old planning documents is just to ask whether something is shovel-worthy, not just shovel-ready. And oftentimes that brings up the quiet folks who are afraid to say something. Um, and afraid to create more work for colleagues who are stretched thin and just trying to get grant applications in and move projects. So I, we found a lot of goodwill when you can create space to acknowledge where people are overworked and trying to default toward what's mostly cooked or easy. And also to give them cover for raising something that might be hard to say, um, where we can we can help say it instead. All right, I see Peter's hand up and then Andy's hand, and then I've got one more. Maybe we'll go with those two, and then there was one in the chat that I want to throw in. And I see Peter trying to get off of mute, it looks like. Peter, if you're talking, we at least I can't hear you. All right, let's let Peter figure that out. We'll go to Andy and we'll come back to you, Peter. Keep your hand up. Hi, everybody. I, um, this is my first and apparently I'm catching the last uh, uh, group meeting that you guys are having. So I appreciate Jeremy reaching out to me earlier and inviting me. Um, I'm the CEO of the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation. So we're a housing provider and more um, that is focused on the East Bay. Um, and when you look at um, the sort of famous redlining FHA maps and you look at overlay that with where we work, that's pretty much where we work. Um, 
in in that sort of vein, we also work in those communities that have been really uh, just incalculably damaged by the way that infrastructure has been implemented in their communities. So, you know, West Oakland entirely surrounded by infrastructure projects. Uh, Chinatown, where in Oakland, where we were born, BART just ran right through the middle and tore up, you know, the right straight through the middle of Chinatown. Uh, you know, East Oakland, just giantly impacted by um, environmental exposures, as is West Oakland. So all, all, all these communities, um, you know, are in a place where we feel like there is really incredible opportunity um, with the funding sources that you mentioned. I mean, when you know, when when I started to see these things pass, and I know absolutely zero about sort of infrastructure and how that is implemented and where the money comes from. And yet, you know, even that was enough for me to say, well, there's such an opportunity here to really improve the lives of people who who have, are surrounded by infrastructure that they almost never get on. Um, uh, but I know nothing about it. Like, I don't know how do we uh, raise our voices? How do we have a positive impact on like not we don't want to stop things. We want to engage with the planners and the allocators of these funds to make sure that um, uh, the way that the dollars get spent, the things that we improve, um, take, take everybody's impact in mind. Um, the, the other question that I'll ask is really around affordable, a thing called uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing. I'm just going to raise this thing everywhere, every forum, whether anybody cares or not. So there, there is a, there's a basically a, uh, uh, there's a HUD policy called affirmatively furthering fair housing. Okay, Amy got something to say about this, I know. Um, and uh, the, the, the way that it is being implemented in the state of California, it is essentially pushing dollars to low cost areas for how affordable housing development. But when you line that up against the state's other sort of policy positions around all this, around like where you want to develop in more sort of dense environments and all this kind of stuff, which we could really talk about for hours, these things are in direct conflict. Um, and so uh, I'm going to keep saying this stuff. If anybody wants to see the FHA map overlaid with the TCAC and uh, SIDLAC opportunity areas, I will share that with you. And you could just see that. The way that we're doing now is basically we're redlining all over again. So uh, I'll get out the soapbox, stop there, and just say I'm looking for help here. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, let's go back to um, Peter if he can. This will be our our test. Nope. Nope. Yeah, Peter will type it in and we'll go to there. Um, I do want to throw in um, and then we'll get to um, uh, Robin and Heidi, but I want to throw in the question that was in the chat that Michelle um, from uh, uh, from Public Advocates, I think she had to leave early, but she was asking, Sarhan, as in, for you in particular, uh, talk to us a little bit how the administration intends to implement uh, you know, the Justice 40 initiative out of the White House, which I think has relation a little bit to, or not a little bit, a lot to what Andy was uh, just talking about in terms of like, where does investment go? And then, you know, at most importantly, how um, does it does it go there? So as I mentioned, we are having an equity lens in every single uh, investment that we are providing. Uh, as you have seen in many of the investments in the recent years, uh, not affordable housing specifically, but other uh, type of investments, there has been some sort of like uh, mention of the, how this should go to disadvantaged communities. Um, with the greenhouse gas reduction funds, we have a really good precedent on how it could be done and how it could be successful and like pitfall of that as well. So uh, we have been trying to use that as a roadmap to make sure that we are investing in the communities that have been left behind, like in the basic infrastructures, on like um, the deep infrastructure need, like updating their sewer water systems. Uh, looking into disadvantaged unincorporated communities across California, making sure they are having access to resources that they need, and like being basically more strategic in where our dollars goes. 
Um, one of the programs that I uh, managed uh, previously at SGC is called Transformative Climate Communities Program, which is focused on disadvantaged communities and highest, like uh, uh, back in the uh, Cali virus screen. And one of the things that we actually piloted there was the idea uh, that Shalani mentioned, like is a project shower ready or shower worthy. So we were not requiring the applicants to come to us with a shower ready projects. We asked them to have a couple projects that are ready and to go, but we gave them the money to think about the projects that the community wants, but are not necessarily ready. And we're giving them money to get ready and be there within a year. But we're looking into a comprehensive set of things that they can bring to the community. So it's not, only affordable housing, and I hear you, Andy, the concern that you have. But if the community is in need, needs a park, they should get a park. If they need a, a like bike paths, they need to get that. If there is like infra, like zev infrastructure that's missing, that's uh, where they can access this money. And our goal is to kind of like uh, communicate these pilots in what we had and what we see as a successful model to other state agencies and help them think through that lens of how they can uh, invest more responsibly and more equitably across the state of California and making sure that the no community is left behind. And that's the lens that we will use for justice for it. Just one other thing that I would also mention, um, there was an executive order that uh, put the equity commission in the OPR that we are hoping to stand up early next year. And uh, more to come on that, and we'll let you know how that goes. All right. Thank you, Sarah Inez. Uh, let's go to Robin, and then we'll go to Heidi, then we'll come back to Peter's question in the chat. Um, well, uh, uh, Sahar and I, you pretty much just answered kind of my question, at least the majority of it. Uh, and Andy, there was no uh, no timing around my raised hand. I think AFFH should be brought up in every conversation. Um, uh, the, I, I think my, my question um, maybe is a bit more technical, but I, I love you talking about kind of where the infrastructure funds go and paying attention to that. I think one question I have and, and one exciting development that I'm, I'm curious if you're going to kind of take forward in your work um, that I was looking at is both is the kind of uh, where infrastructure funds come in in terms of like the overall capital stack for a project and when they come in. And I, I just really was excited to see kind of the inclusion of the catalytic um, infill qualifying areas within the um, infill infrastructure grant program and just separating that from being project more kind of utilized um, as like project based approach versus like an area that there should be more you know, densification in. And so I'm curious if you're kind of taking that that more first in approach in terms of funding with other programs. And is that something you also see as affirmatively further for housing and equity goals? So um, there is a reality about how the programs are run. Most of the programs come with a statute and requirements. So I see that the, somebody mentioned HSC program here. Uh, there, it, there, there are requirements that the program must set up based off of that. It's out of my hand, anybody's hands, legislator that decide how that works. Um, many of you have gone through the read process now. You know that again, there are things that are there, they're in a, a trailer bill language, things like that, that we kind of like get the program as it is and we have to implement it. So um, with the HSC program, it's actually last dollar in, not the first dollar in. <laughs> but, TCC program, we try, we have more flexibility. The statute is four uh, sentences, which gives us a lot of flexibility to build the program, how we think it would work. So it, we were able to actually be more flexible with the TCC program. Uh, but um, again, we are trying, based off of what we built at that program, we're trying to communicate that the state needs to uh, look into the shovel worthy project, less of a risk, like we like, like less risk minded, which has been the way that the government has been operated. Like we are trying to protect the um, taxpayer dollars in expense of like not spending them uh, in a way that they should, especially in the communities that uh, don't have the capacity and the way that we measure them uh to absorb those funds so kind of how can we change the mentality to provide the room for these communities to be included 
Otherwise, they will be left behind no matter what. There is no way that the community of East Oakland would have had money to apply for our uh, funds uh, that are like shower ready per se. We have to give them something to stand up what they think their community needs to go through the process to do the pre-development work and all of that and make sure that it's something the community wants. So that's where we are really trying to start and kind of like help the other state agencies to come to a place that, okay, we need to kind of like shift the mentality, make sure that everybody can have like a um, access to these dollars and be able to build the communities across California that are sustainable, not focus everything in every like a one community or another. So I hope that that would help us to also uh, reach, reach some of the Fair Housing Act goals um, with providing more resources to many of communities that uh, redline and continue to be redline. They need deserve parks, they deserve resources, they deserve community centers and all of that. They shouldn't be like, uh, we shouldn't just put affordable housing there without any resources. If you are putting that, the other resources should come with it. All right. So we just lost Heidi, unfortunately, um, as she was about to get to her question. Uh, but Peter uh, just put his in the um, in the chat. So let me just read that out. So um, uh, y'all know the ins and outs of infrastructure funding programs and processes, um, you know, coming from the housing policy advocacy perspective and having worked in a, on a few project pro uh, funding programs over the years. I've experienced how critical and often contested the process is for a defining what is infrastructure. Um, you know, affordable housing is not necessarily a typical category and certainly not um, anti-displacement housing investments or housing services. And B, uh, for hammering out the metrics by which infrastructure projects are prioritized and scored when steering investment dollars, um, uh, when steering investment dollars. So I'm curious if you can muse on how malleable this uh, uh, larger realm of infrastructure funding can be as we aim to be creative and expansive about how community building and equitable development can be advanced through an entitled recognition of how infrastructure or an enlightened uh, uh, recognition, there's probably an entitled recognition in there too, but an enlightened uh, recognition of how infrastructure investments uh, make or break those equity aspirations. Uh, big wide open question. We would love to hear your off the cuff thoughts. Peter, I live in the space between your two questions and the work that we do. And so <clears throat> these are things that I reflect on pretty often. I, I think there's far more flexibility than we often assume. And I think it's because it's hard to find the flexibility, not because it's not there. And you often need to invest the time and it's rarely um, one department or one agency that can do it alone. So you need to have champions who are talking to each other and willing to risk together. I think where that's yielded the most benefit is where you, you can find the people who are creative with procurement. It's the same type of people. <laughs> you know, and, and so we, even in spaces where we haven't built anything for a long time, those are the people you want. And you kind of want the early career ones who are a little bit fearless and unjaded by what hasn't worked. But I'm wildly optimistic about the potential for the moment we're in. I mean, this is the most money since Roosevelt, and we can set the trajectory in the next five years for the next 50 so I, I very much hope that there's enlightened recognition of this and we're seeing it pop up from all corners. So I just wanna to share that enthusiasm and optimism in response to your questions. So. And I, I think what I would say, which is kind of maybe a lazy response is just, you know, it speaks to the importance of having flexible funding, right? Um, and that to the extent that we can have, you know, funds like REAP 2.0, but maybe with not quite as many, um, you know, strictures within it, but that have the high level goals that we're going after, um, you know, then we can just really use that to mix and match with all the other more siloed funding and deliver, um, you know, on these kind of multi benefit, but don't fit into a perfect pot types of uh, projects. Yeah. 
one thing that I would suggest is don't forget to work with your community, with the nonprofits on the ground, people that live everyday life of like being in that community. That's where the creativity lies and where they really can help you to come up with things that can change the trajectory of that community. In many cases, I see planners look in the local jurisdictions kind of like trying to come up with these ideas. Ideas are in the community, work with them, bring them in, make the room for them to bring their ideas to you. Um, I can give you 10 examples of like projects that I personally thought they would definitely fail. They're my most beloved projects today. But I am so lucky that we didn't kill it. We didn't say no, and we let them to keep try and try until they got it right. So believe in your community, in your people, and work with them closely, provide the room for them. That's what I would like to leave you with. Yeah. Um, so one, you know, it's, it's less of a question and more of a, a potential next step, actually. Uh, and back to you, Saranaz, in the sense that um, I think that connecting to the community is indeed absolutely critical. And I know, um, you know, conversations I've had with uh, Louise Bedsworth, you know, formerly of SGC, one of the things that she has brought up, um, you know, in, in many occasions where she's like, yeah, the, the frustration was in trying to push out, um, uh, trying to push out, um, uh, uh, trying to push out dollars was to, um, uh, not be able to connect with those community folks easily enough. And so I think figuring out what's the, what are the mechanisms there? So we are um, uh, after the hour. Um, and this has been, I think, a you know fantastic um, uh, conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, we're having some people drop off. But uh, maybe uh, one last question to Saranez, um, to Shalini, and to Rebecca. Um, you know, we're putting together this 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 intersectional group here. Um, so say five years from now, and you know, we've been successful at um, you know, doing some transformative um change in the system. What looks different? What have what have what have we what have we succeeded at? What have we achieved? I would love to see projects uh, that are addressing multiple issues at the same time. We have tried really hard, but it's really challenging to find good examples of that in the actual implementation world. There are like some examples, but not many. I think our design and engineering world hasn't evolved with the pace that we are thinking. They are still operating in the silos that they have been like operating for probably 100 years now. So how we can kind of like bring those mentality to those uh, professions that uh, building design, street design, and all of that could be more dynamic uh, and more like uh, thoughtful in integrating solutions that will help a community more resilient and bring change the standards and all of that reflected and help the communities to implement those. I see like in many cases, even like most fabulous ideas are kind of killed because of like a random standard somewhere that is like preventing it to be implemented. So those type of things are things that I'm really hungry for and I'm hoping to see in future, uh, which I think could be uh, something that could happen and we can push boundaries on it. Wonderful, Shalani, Rebecca? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, my first thought kind of building on a lot of Sahara Noza's comments about going, you know, into the community is that, um, you know, if this group's successful, ideally, like communities know how to plug in, like they, 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 with these various, you know, community groups across California that, you know, want to see change in their communities, they, they have a sense of how to, how to plug in and, where the resources are to help um, do that, you know, early planning work, whether it's resilience or or other transportation, housing needs, um, and then you know that programs are designed in a way that reduces the administrative burden. So maybe there is some kind of as we evolve some consolidation and simplification, um, you know, so there aren't like fifty different programs, um, which just does make it it challenging and create a barrier. 
All right. And last word for you, uh, Shalini. Yeah. So three items for the wish list: more community-centered and community-led projects, more money and shovels to the places that haven't been first in line for either, and uh, more fearlessness inside of local government and within collaboration. So, Saharan, as we see more of what you're describing. Yeah, I, I love that word fearlessness at the end there, and I think it relates a little bit back to the answer to Peter's question about um, really what sort of flexibility do we really have? Um, and I think, you know, whether it's through the OBAG program or some of the projects you mentioned, like in Hoboken, uh, Shalini, um, you know, those are some examples of some fearlessness and some creativity and a word that, you know, we use a lot. I think I used it in my my intro is you know, that fierce commitment to equity environment and um, and affordability. And I think, you know, bringing that to bear as we move this work forward, um, I, I think will take us a long way. Um, so just really quick, I want to say thank you all for, for being here. Uh, huge thanks to our, to our speakers again. Um, and um, uh, if you are not already signed up for the Build a Green newsletter, um, uh, Alara has dropped it in the chat. And we will, um, and that's a good way for you to keep in track of, of what's going on and what we're doing. Um, and even though Andy did, you know, flag again, this is the last meeting of the group in its current incarnation, I think there'll be a second incarnation. So um, stay tuned, uh, stay tuned for that. So again, thank you all. And we'll talk to you uh, soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks,